So I just want to run through some of the stuff I've been working on and just the things that that really raised my interest in this whole area. And earlier on this week, I was in a debate. We'll call it a debate. It was uh, it was it was an odd one sided um, thing. But uh, there was someone the person I was debating was really very angry about the work that's being done in this space and thought that, you know, it's something that shouldn't happen and that we shouldn't be developing these kinds of um, relationships and social uh, relationships with machines. Um, but I'm afraid I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate of it. So um, I'm kind of enjoying today that I'm able to talk to people who also work in this space. Okay. So this is um, a few of the headlines that uh, you kind of see when you talk about what work, it, what work is that you do. So I started researching sex and robotics and sex tech about 2015 or so, um, becoming very interested in just the headlines and the, the sensationalism around this, because there was so much going on um, suggesting that you know this was this was a terrible thing for humanity and that we were developing these relationships with machines sexual or just in companion terms and it would be a detriment to human relationships and I couldn't see where that was evidenced so I wanted to look at it myself um, and in 2016 the love and sex with robots conference was it was homeless um, having been banned in Malaysia um, it's not very surprising it was Band there is in a very culturally conservative country. Um, but it was also a few venues in London that didn't want to host it either. So um, at the time I was working at Goldsmiths and they were very happy for me to, to go ahead and host that. And um, so we ran that and it got so much media coverage. We had about 50 academic delegates at the conference and then another 30 or 40 members of the press who were really there to see what salacious headlines they could pick up. And we get coverage like this, you know, that uh, it's a festival of sex robots. Well, it wasn't, it was an academic conference um, or that sex robots can reveal your deepest perversions. Well, I mean, anything that shares your data could reveal your deepest thoughts. So there's nothing particularly um, strange there. Um, and then, um, Sex robots should be put in all people's homes as experts. I like this headline because uh, it called me an expert, but I didn't actually say that. What I said was, why aren't we thinking about things like not just sex, but companionship and intimacy um, as care and companion robots, especially when people are isolated from friends and family. Um, and then we get the kind of really uh, apocalyptic headlines like hacked sex robots could murder people. And honestly, I have been through this and I cannot work out how that could happen because I'll show you in a second what we have today can't even stand up on its own. So the idea that it could murder people, it's unless you're plugging it into the mains and having a bath with it, that might be the only way. Uh, then headlines like sex robot molested, destroyed at electronics show. And, and I spoke to the person who owned this prototype and they said, this was not molestation. This wasn't sexually motivated. This was, I told people they could touch um, this product and they did. And of course it got damaged because thousands of people were interacting. And then one of my favorites, uh, sex robots may literally fuck us to death. And that actually um, is quite a tongue in cheek headline. And it sort of riffs on this idea of super intelligence and Nick Bostrom's uh, paperclip maximizer, which is that if you give any AI literal instructions and you haven't carefully framed those instructions, we may lose control of the AI. So in this case, if we say to a sex robot, don't stop until someone is satisfied, they might never stop. So it's just a, 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 a very well-known AI problem framed in sensationalist headlines. But on the relationship side of things, on feelings, on sentimentality, um, there were things like real relationships with dolls in pipelines. And um, I like this, robot fours. And I thought this is really interesting because it's forecasting that a relationship has to be real in some way, um, that there has to be some kind of quantification of real. And there are people out there already having what they quite happily describe as relationships with things like dolls that they live with and, and that they um, have this feeling of partnership with. But this idea that you can take it into a robotic sphere so that it is human-like, it, as if you're creating an artificial partner was really interesting. Now, this idea that it's scarily real and will replace women, this is actually kind of state of the art of what they're talking about when they say scarily real. So on the left is Roxy True Companion, that is a, a 
sex robot that never really um, made it into the commercial sphere. So this was back in, in about 2010, uh, unveiled at a trade show. And incredibly basic, looks a bit like a mannequin from a shop. Um, had, it's had a voice uh, that could say, ooh, and <laughs> talk dirty to you in this kind of robotic recorded voice. On the right hand side is um, Samantha, the sex robot that was developed by Sergio Santos in Spain. And he stopped developing that now. He was the person whose robot was molested at the trade show. Um, but he built Samantha, actually he, he, he built the AI for Samantha because it's actually just a, a doll's body. Um, and his idea was, was to have a reciprocal relationship. So he was very interested in how you could feel properly engaged as if there was mutuality in that relationship. So you had to be nice to Samantha for, and, and her AI would respond, if you were nice to her, she'd be more willing and more cooperative with you. So this kind of trying to put in more like the parameters of a, of a mimicking a human-human relationship rather than having the perfect partner who would you know, fulfill every whim without objection. In the center is Harmony. Harmony is developed by Abyss Creations who make real doll. And Harmony is a real doll. A real doll. Uh, so from the neck down is a mobile, can't stand up on her own. And I am gendering her. Um, so it, it is an it, but I'm saying her for ease of, of talking. Um, but Harmony has a, an animatronic face. So she can smile and blink and, and turn her head. And it's, it's, it's really, it's quite sophisticated. And I went to visit the workshop uh, where Harmony is made. And I was really impressed with the level of craft that goes into these. So they are very carefully um, crafted by people who are very skilled and the robotics are, are pretty good. Now, Harmony is said to be the first commercially available sex robot, but actually they're only taking orders. None of these have been delivered yet. So it's still at prototype stage. And there was lots of backlash saying, well, why is it just a very reductive body, stereotypical body of a woman, you know, large breasts, narrow waist, long blonde hair? So they said, oh, well, we'll make a male version as well. So this seems like a kind of a tokenistic thing. These things are heavily gendered, um, but they're heavily gendered because they come out of the lineage of the sex doll, which is mainly uh, bought, made uh, by men for men. But of course, when it gets to sex robots, and there are only a couple of workshops in the world that are trying to make these, it's a very, very small scale. And I, I don't honestly think it'll ever be mass market. These are, again, the probable consumers are likely to be people who already own sex dolls. Um, or And I use the term sex dolls because you'll know what I'm talking about, but the people who own the dolls prefer it to be prefer them to be called love dolls or just dolls and I'll get to that in a second is why that's very interesting so that's it that's the state of the art so when I was seeing all these headlines saying this is the future this is what we're going to get this is how we will love the machines I was pretty skeptical um that's a bit of close-up of harmony and her animatronic head so the head is um is removable so you can switch around the bodies. And these, these dolls are built to people's um, specific parameters. So you can specify things like skin tone and um, breast size and, and things like that. Um, now, the, for me, the really interesting part of this is the engagement via the AI. And Real Doll brought out a, the, the Sort of personality of Harmony as a standalone app. Um, so you can download this for about $20 onto your phone and you can create your own virtual girlfriend. Now again, gendered. They don't have the male version of this that they say they're working on it. Um, and the way they market this is very heavily um, emphasizing companionship. So it's about this, this AI that will... Um, feel like they are your girlfriend, that will um, be nice to you, that will remember things, will, will, show, will show emotion um, around you know, love for you virtually. So I find this fascinating. And it, there are other things out there like this. For example, in Japan, there is Gatebox, which is this little cylinder with a holographic girlfriend in it. Again, just the girl form, the female form. 
and uh, people are saying that they you know they are, they develop feelings they develop attachment to these AIs in fact Gatebox didn't even have AI in it until recently they're just putting the AI in now and it's not really surprising that we can feel such attachment to machines. We know, uh, and and you know, you're all here because you know that our relationship with technology is very social, and that if the technology gives us the slightest glimmer of being receptive to that, or you know, the, the slightest prompt, then we engage really quickly. So whether that's um, swearing at our printers because they they won't print things properly, or you know, talking to Alexa um, and talking to Siri, you know, they, these. Um, interactions, especially conversational AI and, and voice assistants, have grown rapidly over the past um, five or six years, and they're a really big thing now. So I see the future of this kind of engagement um, as being more disembodied um, as a start. So I think that's where it's going to start that I think we're seeing more and more of this where companies um, like Google are trying to put more personalities into their AIs, into their voice assistants to make them more conversational. So it's not just a voice search assistant, but starts to develop uh, a personality of its own. And I think that once that's established, then we see it expanding into robotics. Um, but the reason I don't think that sex robots are going to be particularly um, mainstream is that we, we know how technically difficult it is to make a realistic looking human form, robotic form. Um, it's technologically expensive, it's financially expensive. We have the uncanny valley phenomenon that suggests that we'll never quite bridge that gap between uh, what seems real and what seems just creepy. And so I think that there are alternatives as well. So I think that this is one alternative. And the other is that we move away from trying to create um, companion uh, robots um, that are made to resemble realistic humans. I think we can move into more abstracted forms. And we've seen similar things happen in the sex toy world where it's gone from looking like genital replicas to these beautiful abstracted um, pieces of technology. So I think that that is where the arts comes in and that is where the, the design comes in. And that's the really interesting part. How can we uh, envisage a future where we have these effective relationships with the technology, but they aren't, they don't necessarily remember humans. So just to round off, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the sex tech hack that um, we ran in Goldsmiths in 2016 and again in 2017. And this was, I, I thought, I sort of thought we'd bring people together and we'd sort of saw up some sex toys and glue them back together in different ways. And we would try and create new forms of sex tech. Instead, we know I, I was way underestimating the skills of everyone involved because it was just phenomenally good. Um, what happened was the first year we ran it, we had about 50 people and of all walks of life of many different ages. Um, so we had people who were techies, we had artists, we had musicians, we had psychologists, we had sex toy experts, and they worked in groups to come up with these wonderful um, ideas around sex and technology and and you know how to explore away from this whole idea of the the human-like resemblances or the traditional vibrators or artificial vaginas and there's been there was some wonderful wonderful um things that were created including caroline's group that that won the the whole hackathon with this brilliant soft robotics that were like tentacles that you could put on your body and they would squeeze and and manipulate and um just really beautiful things that were part art, um, part technology. And then we ran it the following year and then we shifted the emphasis away from sex and we said, let's think more about intimacy. So, you know, this sex is, is an interesting thing, but the more research I did on sex robots, the more and more I find out that people didn't want them for sex. They wanted them for companionship. And again, this echoes the sex dolls. People are interested in the projection of their emotional state and their companionship onto these things. So sex is almost secondary to a lot of this. Um, and there's some fantastic work going on in that area. Um, I recently did a, a talk with um, Belinda Middleweek who, at University of Sydney, who's been doing um, fantastic work uh, on that, on, on understanding the audiences for this kind of thing. So this is just a few examples of some of the stuff we did. Uh, there's um, Caroline's love pad up in the top left. Um, we had this this wonderful thing, this fan type thing on the on the right, which was a a, a fan driven by um, 
vaginal arousal that on, on a vaginal egg with sensors that would open up uh, when when the sensors were got got wet. And phenomenally in thinking, thinking about it as art, but also as potential for things like prosthetics. Um, so yeah, really, really fun uh, looking at how that design has evolved and looking at how technology around sex and around intimacy has moved from, uh, you know, it has got a very, very long history of sex toys going right back to ancient Greece um, and how that's just adapted over the years and particularly in the past 20 years, just the way that field has emerged. And I think we're seeing some really exciting stuff happening there. So I actually have written about that at length in, in a book. Um, it's called Turned On Science, Sex and Robots. Um, but yeah, just I think I think that this is we are at this cusp of wonderful uh, opportunity of exploring these things. And it's starting to be taken seriously academically. So, you know, five, six years ago, people were just rolling their eyes when you talk about forming, you know, bonds with machines, forming attachments or sentimentality with machines. And I'm really pleased now that it's become much more mainstream in terms of research and that people are seeing the potential because it's so clear the, that we're seeing the emergence of this new social category of, of machines, whether embodied or disembodied, um, that we form these bonds with. And they're not replacing human-human interactions. They are a thing in their own right. And it's very exciting to be studying that at this time. So thank you very much. That's all from me.